Shalom Chavrim. It is the uh, coming to the close of uh, Hanukkah right now, and uh, I want to greet you. And this message that I'm going to speak with you this evening is very lengthy. Um, it is. I have no idea how long it will take to go through this message, but this is probably one of the most critical messages I believe that I have um, done to date as far as dealing with a multitude of subjects. I, I guess really what brought me to this place here was we're in Hanukkah right now, and also we are facing for the Christian believers uh, that believe that Jesus is Mashiach, what they believe to be the birth of Jesus to celebrate at, at Christmas time, um, their gift giving is, is, as well. And I just really began to kind of seek the Lord to know what could I say that would be a gift to the people, that something that God that you might reveal to my heart that would be like a gift to the people. Because in Hanukkah, it's a very special occasion for the Jews. And then God began to deal with my heart on Hanukkah itself. And as he did, I saw in the story of Hanukkah one of the most incredible revelations I believe I've ever gotten and how it ties in to the, not only the identity of the Messiah, but also the timing of the revelation of when the Messiah will be revealed. Um, and so as I, as I mention this to you, what I am asking you right now, before we get into this message here, uh, I'm gonna cover some territory that I've covered in other videos as well, because I feel that it's very important that I recap things from the past as well as the things that God is dealing with my heart on now so that the Jewish people that might see this video will have the opportunity to hear the whole picture. And yet it's also going to be a gift to both uh, uh, men and women of the Christian faith as well. And I say men and women because there's a special gift in here, a special blessing for women in particular, and something that husbands really must and need to hear, especially in the society that we're living in today. Uh, and so I'm asking you, please share this video with every single person you possibly can. If you would, when you hit the share button on Facebook, copy that link, control C, put it in an email and send it to all your friends. Put it on your Facebook, share it on Facebook, Twitter, any other social media you can. And then ask the people as well that watch it, share it with as many people as they possibly can. Right now we're watched in 118 countries around the world. It is growing. The number of people that subscribe to the channel is growing weekly. And I thank God for that. Not that I care about the numbers themselves per se. Israel is number nine in, uh, ranked number nine out of the 118 countries as the, as the people that view the messages that are on here. So we do have hundreds of views coming from the Israeli people uh, in Israel watching these videos. So I'm asking uh, for your prayers as we do the video. I'm asking you also to share it. And if God were to lay it on your heart to be a part of this ministry, the Noon Institute of Biblical Research, uh, we will post at the end of the message the website and the address if you care to be a part of that in helping us to take the gospel to, uh, to my people, the, to the Jewish people. So if you have your Bibles handy, we're going to be looking at several things uh, in Genesis. Uh, also from the Christian Bible, we'll be going to the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verses 21. Uh, and I'm going to start out, though, real quick with you here. And where we're going to begin at is I want to share with you a little bit about Hanukkah. Now, I'm going to tell you part of it, and then we're going to get into a little bit more of it as we go. The story of Hanukkah, as we have our menorah here burning right now, um, my candles are supposed to last a half hour, so they're probably going to burn out during this video. But anyway, the middle candle here is what we call the shamash. And this is where, when we're lighting the menorah in the beginning, we light from the right to the left, but as each day goes by, like when you get to the eighth day, you light from the far left and you come all the way back over. The actual eight days of the candle, there's nine candles on the menorah, but the shamash does not count as one of those other than the lighting of the menorah. But the whole significance for this the, 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 is because the menorah originally was seven candles. As you see written in the Bible, the seven lampstands are the uh, 
both written in the in the in the uh, Tanakh as well as in the Christian Bible speaks about the seven candle stands. Uh, I had an interesting email sent to me that there was a brother out there that suggested that the nine candles that we have now also represent the two witnesses. I thought that was kind of interesting uh, because he says in the book of Revelation it also calls those two witnesses as it's mentioned in the book of Zechariah, the two olive branches as the two lampstands. A little interesting insight. I thought that was kind of neat uh, to hear that. But in reality, eight of the candles is what represents the story of Hanukkah. There's the seven candle menorah, but the one extra was the holiday that Judas uh, Maccabee uh, had brought into Israel at the, at the defeat of the Syrian army uh, who had overtaken Jerusalem. And now Antichus, who was the king, Antichus IV of Epiphanes, uh, he was the king of Syria at the time, and when they uh, took Jerusalem, they kept that city under siege uh, for quite some time. I'm going to get into that a little bit later, the length of time, because there is a very significant insight on that. But when the Maccabees, they, they warred against the Syrians during that time, and they overthrew them. Now, this was over a span of, uh, you know, uh, some, some years there to get to, to, to defeat them, but they finally defeated them. And when they did, they went in and uh, Antichus, he had taken and set up the, uh, an altar to the god of Zeus in the temple. They had profaned the temple and the cruces of oil and everything had all been profaned. But there was one cruise of oil that was still in the temple that had not been profaned. And it had the seal of the high priest still on it. It was still intact. Now, one cruise of oil would only give the menorah enough oil in the seven golden candle lampstands to burn for one day. But the miracle that we find is that when they put the oil in the lampstands there, it burned for eight days. Now, the miracle behind that, when we say a miracle, is because, one, it couldn't have lasted more than a day, but God allowed that oil to last for eight days, which just so happens to be the same length of time it takes to press the olives to get the new oil again to be able to keep the menorah going. So at the end of that time that that oil lasted, it was able to, uh, they were able to have the new oil. Now, here's the beauty behind this that God began to deal with me on. The whole story of, uh, of Hanukkah, which Hanukkah means the uh, rededication, but... We, it was actually according to Josephus, Josephus, Josephus said in the back in those days that it was called the Festival of Lights, which we refer to it as well in our day as well, the Festival of Lights, because of the miracle of the eight days of, of, that the menorah was able to burn. But as I looked at this story, many of you may not know, but the number eight for the eight days represents eternity. We have seven days. We have... Uh, on earth, you know, we have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Actually, it begins Sunday as the first day of the week, but uh, just kind of giving you the way they do here in the, in, in the United States here. Uh, everywhere we see in the scripture, when you look at the number eight, it represents eternity because God uh, did the earth in seven days or 7,000 years, whichever way you want to translate it based on earth time or, or, or heavenly time. And on the seventh day, he rested. But after that seventh day, just like it is in days of the week, it goes into the eighth day, which is eternity. Now, I saw that when you looked at that one crucial oil that had not been defamed, you know, or profaned, excuse me, had not been profaned, is a type of Mashiach. It is a type of the Messiah. And when the Messiah came, he was not profaned, but he was carrying within him the spirit of Almighty God. And when he is opened, when the seal is broken, so to speak, and that oil can be poured out into the vessels, it can produce a miraculous light in our lives. And being that it's the number of eight days representing eternal life. And so the whole story that happened with Hanukkah, with the Maccabee brothers, with, with Judas Maccabee being the leader of this, that God not only give them the ability to defeat the Syrians at that time and to push them out, but the miracle is that it foreshadowed the fact that Mashiach would come. Now, oddly enough, 
we have gone down through, it's interesting to, to think about this here, we've, we've had about 6,000 years in, in the history of mankind, but we've come down through all this time and everything, and we've, we have seemed to not recognize who Moshiach really is. And the story itself is so ironic because we find that the Syrian army and uh, Antiochus, he had actually taken control of the temple, the temple and the, and, and the temple mount, the, all of Jerusalem and everything. He had murdered the Jews like crazy in there. And he had control of it for three years and six months. Now, now go figure that. Now, how many times do I tell you guys when I, I, I say to you that the scripture says that, that, there, that you know, that uh, in, uh, I say uh, scriptures in Revelation 11, where that they're going to take, and, and, and it says there that um, John said that he was given a reed likened to a rod. He said, measure the temple and measure the altar. Leave out the outer court because it's given to the Gentiles, for they shall tread the holy city underfoot for 40 and two months. That's three years and six months. That's a future event still yet to happen. And the Antichrist is to come and, 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 and perpetrate this on Israel. He's to take control of the holy city for three and a half years. And the same thing happened in the days when Antichrist was, uh, uh, who was the king of Syria, came in and took control of the city. Now, this might cause some of the brothers out there and sisters that believe that, you know, they kind of look at that and they'll say, you know, well, brother that says in the scripture that it's, you know, they look at an Antichrist being a Syrian. Do you not, I don't know how much of this you know. If you ever study the history on Antichrist to begin with, he's controlled by Rome in the first place. In fact, when he was warring with Egypt and, and some of the other campaigns that he was doing, Rome stepped up and said, you won't go any further. So he's controlled by Rome. And that's why I've always kind of leaned towards the idea that the, that the next pontiff that will come on into power will be, yes, a Syrian, but he'll be a pontiff and he'll be Arab descent. So this is the unique situation that we find ourselves in. We have a man that's under Roman control. Now get this. In the Vatican, the Pope claims to be the vicar of Christ. And the word vicar is a substitute or in the place of. Kind of like, like the Egyptian pharaohs. They were God on earth. Do you know that Antichus IV also believed that he was the incarnate God of Zeus on earth? And Zeus is the, was, the, was, the, was the king of all gods according to uh, uh, Greek mythology. And here he is. He's playing a part just like the popes do today. And oddly enough though, when, when Israel finally comes to her senses, the Maccabee brothers fight this thing. And of course we have, according to Revelation, not Revelation, but according to Daniel's vision, that Daniel has the prophet in the Tanakh, the prophet Hanavi, Daniel, he sees that in the midst of the week, the covenant is broken. But they make a covenant and, and Rome comes in and takes control of, of Israel, of Jerusalem again. And they tread down the city for 40 and two months, three and a half years. And they take away the daily sacrifice. It won't be until Israel wakes up like the Maccabees did and do something about it. And that's when the time when the seal will be broken and their eyes will be open. Who Moshiach ben David will be. That's what, you know, it's just an incredible parallel to see that that crucible God was showing represented Jesus. Now, this is for, now I want to kind of take my Jewish brethren through this a little bit, because maybe you haven't heard this video as of yet before. Maybe you haven't heard me speak of Jesus being Moshiach ben David. Now, before, don't get upset with me. Hear me out. I want to show you some things to prove to you that this is not just this is just not hearsay. This is for real. Now. We have, when, when Moses came out and he, he led our people out of slavery and they were wandering in the wilderness and they're thirsting, they're dying, they hadn't been in the wilderness, what, a week or so, two weeks maybe, 
and they're dying of thirst. They come to Moses and, they, and, and, and you know, what did you bring us out here to die? There's no graves. There's plenty of graves in Egypt. And God says to Moses, take the stick in your hand, take your staff, get the, gather the elders of Israel and go down and smite the rock that it bring forth water. Not the time, not, we're not talking now about, you know, years later when Moses went down and God told him to speak to the rock. I realize that that's also scriptural as well. But the first time he said to go and smite the rock that it bring forth its water. Now, according to the Torah, God was that rock, Hashem. Not a little God, not some other God, not Jesus. Hashem was the rock. It also said he was on the rock. Our great God was the rock, David says in the psalm, I believe it is. I believe Isaiah also mentions the same thing. So we know that God is represented as the rock. Now, not that God himself was the rock. But when Moses smote the rock, the rock was claved in half. And if you want to see a good picture of it, all you have to do is go to uh, uh, um, splitrockfoundation.org and where Ron Wyatt being, I believe, the first one over there, but, but, but as far as uh, with uh, uh, her husband, uh, Brother Caldwell there, Penny and Jim Caldwell, actually have the photo of the rock that, and I believe 100% they're dead on it, that God had had Moses smite. Now, I, we know that it says in Hebrew, Hatsua, the rock. So whether or not it was smote here or smote there, it's still the same rock. We know that. It doesn't make sense to us, but it's the same rock. But the question is, is who is the rock? Now, when we look at this, the reason I bring this point out to you is that when he smote the rock, water gushed out of this rock in so much it was like a huge rivers of water to feed what 1.2 million people. And the, the evidence is there, especially around Mount Sinai, the same way. You can see the evidence of huge water erosion. Look at the pictures. It's awesome to see it. And, but ironically, that itself was God showing, foreshadowing Mashiach ben David that he would come. And not only does it foreshadow the Messiah, but it looks back to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, in the creation. And that's the part I want to get to you to where you'll understand why, you know, what was God doing here? When Jesus, for example, just to give you an idea, no, no, let's, I'll take you back. Let's, let's go to Genesis. Let me just share with you something out of Genesis. This is something that you need to understand. Um... When God created Adam, we know, uh, Jewish people know that God did not call Adam Adam in the beginning. He called him Ish and spelled out of Yod Shin. Now, the rabbis know that that's from, you know, you have the divine letter Yod in the middle, which is the first letter for the divine name of, of God, as we say in Hebrew, Hashem. We don't, we don't actually say the divine name, but... Uh, there are many people that try to pronounce the name in vain, but we know it's in vain. Although there are people that are out there that are trying to say God's name, it can't be correct because the Bible does say that in the last days, or excuse me, that the time will come that he will restore the language again, the pure language where, the na where that name can be spoken and worshiped of God. And I find it ironic that God says that because, uh, gosh, before I get into that, I just want to share with you something. This is something that really burned in my heart uh, over in uh, Shemot, Exodus. Shemot actually means uh, names in, in, in English. It doesn't actually mean the word Exodus, but we translate it as Exodus. But I want to just share with you something um, found in about the third chapter, I believe it is, of Exodus. And so let me just bear with me to get to this here. Um, and this will kind of help you too as far as the ish part so maybe it's good that I go here uh, Moses was uh, shepherding the sheep of Jethro his father-in-law the priest of Midian and he guided the sheep far into the wilderness and arrived at the mountain of God toward Horeb and the angel of Hashem appeared to him in a blaze of fire from amid the bush and he saw and behold the bush was burning in the fire 
but the bush was not consumed. Moses thought, I will turn aside now and look at this great sight. Why will the bush not be burned? Hashem saw him turned aside and, uh, to see, and God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he replied, here am I. He said, do not come closer to me, to, excuse me, do not come uh, closer to here. Remove your shoes from your feet, for the place at which you stand is holy ground. Um, oh, so it's just, just real quick for my Jewish brothers. Ve'yomer Moshe, Moshe, ve'yomar, hineni, ve'yomer. Okay, on holy ground, where he's standing is on holy ground. Now, and he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Moses hid his face, for he is afraid to gaze toward God. Elohai Abraham, Elohai Yaakov, ve Elohai Yaakov, ve Yaster Moshe, Penav Ki Yore, Mehavit El Ha Elohim. Okay, so as we go on to read here, Hashem says, I have indeed seen the affliction of my people that is in Egypt, and I have heard uh, its outcry because of its taskmasters, for I know. I have known of its sufferings, and I shall descend to rescue it from the hand of Egypt, to bring it out of the hand, land of the good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to a place of the Canaanite, the Hittite, and the Amorite, and has, uh, the Hivatite, <clears throat> the Jebusite, and now behold the outcry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression which the Egyptians oppress them. Now go, and I shall dispatch you to Pharaoh, and you shall take my people, the children of Israel, uh, out of Egypt. <clears throat> Moses replied, God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, that I should take the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, for I shall be with you. And this is your sign that I have sent you. When you take to the people of Egypt, you will serve the God on this mountain. Moses said to God, behold, when I come to the children of Israel, this is the key. When I come to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? Now, that's just powerful to me. He says, Ve'yomer Moshe el ha'elohim, Hine anochi ba'el b'nei Yisrael, Ve'amati lahem, Elohai avotechem, Shelachani, You know, the, the, the God of your fathers has sent me, Eliachem, to you, Ve'amuli. See? What, what, they, what would they say to me? Mashimo, what is his name? Ma'omer Elohim, Elohim, ve'yomer. Now this is what God says here. Ve'yomer, Elohim, El Moshe. And the Lord said to Moses, Yihaye, Asha, Yihaye. Ve'yomer kota amar levnei Yisrael. Yihaye shelachani Elohim. You know, I am that I will be, or I am that I am. I am the one that has sent you. That's what you shall tell them. Okay, now, this is what's so incredible. They want to know his name. And this is the same way the Jews will be today. They expect Eliyahu, Elijah the prophet, to come on the scene. Because the scripture says he'll come. In fact, we believe that Moses will come as well. So, but the thing is, as Rabbi Mitzrachi, I heard him say before, you know, if Eliyahu were to come, we're not just going to say, okay, you say you're Eliyahu, we accept that. Prove it. That's what it's going to be with the Jews. Prove it. And one of the main proofs will be, what? Ma Shemo. Ma Shemo. What is his name? I believe that God will anoint them to be able to say the divine name that will bring restoration. And I'm getting off the subject here, but I just wanted to bring that out to you. Uh, also keep in mind, the bush that was there was on fire. Eish uh, Sinai, uh, as we say in Hebrew, Eish Sinai, the bush, the bush, the fire in the bush. Now, I, I say that to you because the word Eish is fire. Sinai means thorn bush. But I'm saying that because we're getting back now to the man. God creates Adam, and he's called Ish. Out of Yod Shin, Yod, the first letter of the divine name, Take out the yod, you have ash fire. So what do we have? We literally have the fire of God. 
So is it fair to say that it was that Adam had the spirit of God? Good question. So let's take and let's look at this then and see if that's really the case. All right, now, in Genesis chapter 2, and keep in mind, Genesis chapter 2 is only a recount of Genesis chapter 1. When God said he created man in his own image, he created them male and female, created he them. And then we get into Genesis chapter 2. It's now breaking down how he did the creation. That's all it is. It's just a recount. If not, then we got double trees. We got double everything. Because he did all this in the beginning in chapter 1, and now he's doing it again in chapter 2. Something wouldn't make sense here. Key verse here, verse 7. And Hashem God formed the man of the dust of the ground, and he blew into his nostrils the soul of life, and man became a living being. All right. Now, for my Jewish brethren, let's take a look at this as well. Verse 7 here. All right. I've got to find it over here in Hebrew here. They had said... Um, they said, Hashem Elohim et Adam, Afar min Adama. So he brings him from the ground. They pach, they pav, nishmat, a breeze, chaim. So he's breathing not just life, he's breathing in a plural form of life. Chai, by the way, a lot of maybe a lot of even Christians might know this. The word Chai in Hebrew means life. It literally is God's life. Because the Yod of the divine letter of God's name is there in it, so we know it's God's life. In this case here, Nishmar Chaim, he breathes in him a plural form of the life of God. Has to be. He's already Ish. The rabbis don't seem to understand that, but we should understand it. We know the rabbis in their own writings right here in the Torah that it comes from the word fire. In fact, they say about uh, when, when God created uh, Eve, it doesn't call her name Eve. She's not called Chava. Chava doesn't come then. Chava comes after the birth of her sons. She's called Isha. Isha. How does Isha spell? Aleph Shin He. Again, the word Eish, fire, in her name. The She, or excuse me, the He at the end. Is the second letter of the divine name. Now, as the rabbis point out, if you take the Yod and the He, now you have Yah, you have God, right there. In plain English, you have God. And they say if you take the Yod and the He out, you have a consuming fire. So if you have, in a marriage, you have God, Adam, uh, the, the, the man and the woman, and when you have it all together, you have God and the man and the woman in a, in a relationship of a husband and a wife and everything, you have unity. Keep that in mind. But if you take God out of the marriage, what do you have? A consuming fire. Because both of them then are fire. Both of them set everything on fire. It's important that we, we catch this. And I'm, I'm a little excited about this because there's a lot here that you need to know. And I, and I really want you to understand that. Now, this is what he says there about Adam there. Now, he, become, he, breathed, in, he breathed in his nostrils life. But it actually says in Hebrew, blew into, I mean, English says, blew into his nostrils the soul of life. Or, as I just showed you, it's, it's a plural form of life because it says, Nishmat Chaim. But then what she says, and man became a living being. That's the English translation of it. What does it say in Hebrew? Ve'yahi ha'adam le'nefesh chaya. Okay? Literally, let's look at what it says. And it was for the man... For his soul, Chaya, the life of God. I mean, you can't get around that. For his soul is the life of God. Adam and Eve had the Holy Spirit. No question about it. Now, I'll prove this to you, though. When it comes to Eve, you say, well, you know, well, I don't know about that. You can't find no place in the scripture where God ever had to breathe in Eve's nostrils after God created her. No place. Why? Because in Adam, Chaim was placed inside of him. He had all of God's life that should have been passed on to their children was in him. And then God taken half of him and broke him in half and placed half of that life in Eve and half in Adam. But the fall caused that life to be broken. Now, let's look, though, before we get the ox before the cart here, let's take a look at this. We need to look at where God creates Eve. 
when he puts Adam into that deep sleep here. Um, and that, okay, let's see here, brothers. It is, we can find that over in verse 21 of chapter 2. So Hashem, God cast a deep sleep upon the man, and he slept, and he took one of his sides, and he filled in the flesh in its place. Now, I like the way that it's translated in the Torah here in English, and not in the King James or any of the other Bibles there, because, uh, which I haven't read all of them, so who knows what I'll, I'll say. It doesn't say in Hebrew that he took a rib. It's just a fallacy. But it does say that he opened up the flesh. Basa, the flesh. Some of the rabbis contend that Adam was literally split in half, and half of that was made into Eve, and the other half, God reformed Adam back up. That's starting to make sense, and I'll tell you why. Because now when you start to look at the rock that was split in the wilderness journey, what happened? The rock was split, and from that rock came that water of life. When Adam was parted in half, God was able to bring out of him Chaim, the life of God. And he was able to put it on to Eve. Now, truly, half that flesh or that flesh that was opened up on him made the DNA for a physical body for Eve. No doubt about it. I will agree with that. But here's how we know what God did here. Now, let me just read to you here. Um, we're getting right here. Then, okay, okay. He took, he took one of his side. Okay, okay. Then Hashem, God, fashioned the side that he had taken from the man into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, This time it is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This shall be called woman for from man she was taken. Now, that's the key right there. But... We think man in English, and we just don't think right. Now, you need to keep that in mind. I really encourage you, especially brothers and sisters, that you're in... Hmm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to probably step on some toes with this one. I can see it coming already. Um, I believe in a full restoration. I believe that when Moshiach comes, he restores back what was lost right here. And this is going to upset some people out there because there's a lot of you that believe that you know, you're the boss of the house and your wife should be doing what you say to do and I do not agree with that, not one bit. Now, I will say this. If you don't have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you're going to have that kind of lifestyle. I guarantee you that too. And you might have the Holy Ghost and not feel that way and just don't know why you feel uh, funny about this, all these different doctrines that say that the man is the boss and he needs to put his house in order and stuff like that. Well, you're going to find out in the Christian Bible, too, you got some problems with the Greek in there as well in the translations because of a patriarchal society at that time when that part was written. We're going to get into that. But I'm first showing you how it was in the beginning. Okay? So keep that in mind. Going back to this again. Where was Eve taken from? According to the Hebrew, Lazot Ikara Isha. Alright? And for this... Uh, she is called uh, Isha, or yeah, Isha, Ki Me'esh, for she is from Ish, not Me'esh, excuse me, Me'ish, because she is from Ish. We're translating that man, but there again, as I showed you, Ish, what man was called originally, we translate that as man, but what he was called was literally the fire of God. That's what he was really was called. So it was the Spirit of God, and we know that in Him was put Chaim. The life of God was put in Him in a plural form. And God says right here that He takes from the man, and He makes this woman, Isha. So it come from, from me, the, word, the letter Mem in Hebrew there, and with the Two little dots under it means me. Me means from in English, like you'd say, translate in English. Me ish, from the man, or from the spirit, or the fire of God. See? Very interesting how God has created her. Now, here's the other cue, uh, uh, something that you need to catch up on, or pick up on here. For from man was she taken, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and cling to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Unity. One. Keep the word unity in mind. In fact, 
Maybe go ahead and turn to Ephesians 5 because this is going to blow you out of the water in a few minutes here when we get to this. But I need to finish first the Hebrew side of this because we're not just dealing with a subject. We're dealing with what was it in the beginning? What were we in the beginning? What was our forefathers? What did they have that we did not have after the fall? Okay? So we're establishing something that they had the Spirit of God and living inside of them. Let's see what they, what they were like with the Spirit of God inside of them. Okay, therefore a man shall leave. We know that. They were, they, we know they'd have to be one. They were going to be in unity. They were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. Now the serpent was more cunning. Um, the beast of the field and the goddess Shem and made. He said to the woman, did perhaps God say you shall not eat of the tree of the garden? Now this is getting into the temptation. But by the way, if you go back, I believe it's in chapter one, when God talks about, let me let me read it. I need to go back because you want to catch that to there where he made them, male and female, God created them. Here, here it is here. It's in chapter one, verse 27. So God created man in his image. In the image of God created he him, male and female, he created them. See, he's making them back at the beginning. Now remember, chapter two is only going into the details of how God did it. Chapter one is showing Quickly what he did. God blessed them and God said to them. Oh, God said to what? To them. So this is where you get this crazy idea that God didn't speak to Eve when God said she did. Or when she said she, God spoke to her. Now, let's just find that out real quick then. God said to them. Hmm, that's interesting. Oh. My gosh, my gosh. Praise God. Let's see here. Yes, he said, so he said to them, um, okay, that's, you know, he created them. And, um, well, it's, it's in English, just plain enough for you. I don't have to actually use it, the Hebrew grammar to kind of straighten that out. So he says to them, let me just leave it like that. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, and rule over the fish and over the sea, the bird of the sky and everything that moves on the earth. Hmm. God said, Behold, I have given you all that the all the herb yielding seed, etc. And he goes in. And notice so God gave them authority of rulership. You don't have anything, no rulership of husband over wife or wife over husband. Isn't that interesting? Interesting what happens when the Holy Spirit is there. And we 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 can't find it. There's no place. God told them that they would have that rulership. So, so when we come back then over here in Genesis 2, uh, and he's made her, he's made the woman, and, and, and we have here, uh, and, and then uh, they, they become one. You know, it says, they leave, they, they leave the father, the husband, and they shall become one flesh. So, th there's unity, and they have co-rights to rule together. Now, then the fall comes. And we're going to get into this because this is having to deal with redemption, my brothers. Because what does redemption, what does redeem mean? Redeem means to bring something back to what it was. So if we're going to be redeemed by Moshiach, he's got to bring us back to what we had at the beginning, right? Exactly. So now, so what happens? We have the fall in the garden. So when the fall takes place in the garden and God comes down and he finds his creation has fallen. Pardon me just for a second here. He finds his creation fallen. And he's upset. And he comes to Adam and he wants to know what happened. Because Adam says that they're naked. I'm just paraphrasing this. And then he says that the woman that you gave me, she did it. And I did eat. And then of course the, the woman says, the serpent beguiled me. And I did eat. And then God begins to deal with the curses. He begins first, he deals with the, with the serpent. Now, this is an interesting part for my rabbi brethren. I've said this before on tape. I'll say it to you again. Rabbi Mizrahi, I know you've said this as well. You try to say that the genealogy is through the male. When you argue the idea that the genealogies is recorded in the Christian Bible, one is different than the other, but they both lead back to David and that there are the Christian scholars that say that one of those genealogies actually applies to Mary and through that side there. 
And you say they can't be because it's through a woman and it doesn't record it that way. But the Torah does say, what does it say right here? And Hashem, God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said to the serpent, the serpent deceived me. And Hashem, God said to the serpent, because you have done this, a curse are you be beyond all the cattle, beyond all the beasts of the field, upon your belly shall you go and dust shall you eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. Actually, you know it doesn't say offspring in Hebrew. It says seeds in Hebrew. I mean, plain as day. We don't have to get into that. I, you know what? I don't want to sit there and try to find it right now because I want to save time. But it's the word seeds in Hebrew. So the seed does come through the woman. So therefore, the apostle in the, in the, in the Christian Bible had every right to, to give the genealogy of Mary and had to do so because in Genesis it says it'll come through the woman. Now, figure that one out. Uh, not didn't want to really get off on that subject there, but here's what here's what happens. So this is what's interesting now. After that happens there, he will pound your head, or he will bruise your head, and you shall bruise bruise his heel. To the woman he said, here's what's interesting here. I will greatly increase your suffering and your childbearing and pain shall you bear children. Mm-hmm. Telede, Teledi Banin. He says you shall bring forth sons. He's prophesying is what he's doing. God is prophesying of what's going to happen. And by the way, the pain and sorrow is not just of an anguish of the body. It's the fact God prophesies she's going to bring forth sons. And the very fact that she brings forth sons and what happens Cain rises up and kills his brother Abel, causing both sorrow and pain to go through this mother's heart over this type of death and what happens there. So it's a prophecy here, but let's look at more. Yet your craving, or in King James, your desire shall be for your husband. Ve'er ishach tasha kutecha ve'hu yimasha. Okay? Gosh, this, this is incredible. Your desire shall be to your husband, and he shall rule over you. This is the result after the fall, brothers. Sisters as well. Pay attention, my sister. You're, this is a gift for you. You're not under bondage. Yes, bondage came because of sin. Sin brought bondage. It made us all slaves to death. Do you realize Adam and Eve would have never died because of the Spirit of God that was inside of them? They were given bodies that would not perish with that life in them. But the thing is, is we were born in corruption because of sin. They lose the Spirit of God and we bring are brought forth in corruption, so therefore we have a body that's corruptible. So even though you could receive the Holy Spirit now, there's no way to live eternally in this body because this body's got the corruption in it. And Jesus come to restore back what was lost. But the problem is, the corruption is still there. That's got to be given give way to still yet. Now, I say this to you, my sisters, because if God says here he shall rule over you, it's not that God was instituting an order, a law, that the husband was now going to be the boss. He's letting us know that he, she, for one, her desire shall be for her husband. She must have had a pretty good, serious relationship with Hashem at that time, I would say. She had a genuine, meaningful relationship with God himself. Not that she didn't love her husband. She was one with her husband. There was unity. They had love. They had God. They had the, the Holy Spirit. But that was broken at the fall. And God clearly shows it. You know, one, she's going to have children. They're going to kill one another. She's going to have a husband that's going to now boss her around. Why? Why? Because he's bigger. You know what? Let me tell you something. If God had made the woman the stronger vessel, you know, when the Bible says she's the weaker vessel, he's talking about physically speaking, not mentally speaking. But if it had been the other way around, God had made her more of a masculine feature, and even though she was a woman and the man had been more, a little bit more of a, a Danny type of guy, then she would have been the boss. God was showing the results of sin. 
Now, while I'm on this, before I get into the redemption part, let me just take, this is for you Christians that are watching the video here, and this, is, this will be good for the rabbi brethren that, that we talk about a lot of times, you know, that well, the Christian Bible doesn't line up with the Torah. Now, for the most part, we probably think because we had a patriarchal society, God tolerated the patriarchal society, by the way, because he knew we were in a fallen nature, God knows a man in a fallen nature. How can you get him to do something normal? He gave us the law. What was the law given to us for? To try to get us in the, in the general direction of doing what's right. But the law doesn't save us, brothers. Sisters as well. It doesn't save us. There's a, if salvation was in the law, then we should have already had eternal life. We should be in the millennium somewhere. But it doesn't. So we might look at the Christian Bible and say, well, they were patriarchal too. Yeah, the society in Jesus' day when he was on the earth was patriarchal. That is true. It was a culture they were dealing with. Let's look here in, in the book of Ephesians. This is the Apostle Paul, a Jewish writer. He says, but that you also may know my affairs and how I do. Um, uh, Tychus, I can't pronounce that guy's name. A beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord shall make known to you all things, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose that you might know our affairs, that he might comfort your hearts. Peace be unto you, brethren, and to love with the faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be all of them that love our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, wait a minute. I think I'm reading in the wrong... Hang on. It's chapter 5, verse 21. My, my apologies. My apologies here. Uh... He says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. That's interesting. By the way, the word submit in Greek is uh, hupato. Uh, gosh, I always mispronounce. Hupoteso. Okay? But that hupoteso is submitting with like authority, whether you're willing to or not. It's kind of like a military term that they would use there. Now, uh, we read that was verse 21. Then here comes verse 22. Wives, submit yourself to your own husbands as unto the Lord. Hmm. Let me finish on verse 21. Uh, okay. When the Greek scriptures was written, when this was translated into English, this is what's ironic. When it says, wives, submit to your husbands, from what I've been told, that's not even in the original text. Interesting. But, let's go on and read a little bit more. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as the Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of, of the body. Now, the word head, kephale, is the Greek word head in this case here. Anytime in the Greek scripture that you use the word kephale, it has nothing to do with authority. And this is where the Christian people are getting it mixed up. Kephale does not mean authority. They have a word in Greek for authority, but it's not kephale. And that's what I find interesting in itself as well. Um, but what, 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 what is he saying here, in this, in this case here, when he speaks of the head, when he uses the word kephale? It's the source or the origin and you can search through the Christian Bible and you can look at all the places where the word head... See, in English, we take the word head and we look at it as, as authority. But in Greek, in the days that when Paul was here, according to that custom, they took it more as source or an origin. Where it come from. And so we look at this here. It says, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto God, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, that word subject, brothers, that is hupotosamai. Little difference in spelling right there. That little difference in spelling changes the word completely from authority. Not even a willing authority. That word there, huputosomai, happens to deal with unity, love. That's what, it, it's actually used as a synonym for agape. So when, when 
Paul is writing right here, and he says to the wife, uh, go back into it again. Um, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Be in unity. We are, look at all the writings that Paul says, to be one with Christ, be one mind with him, like-minded with him. And when we deal with this headship, as they call the headship doctrine, it's not a, it's not a, gosh, this gets so mixed up. Husbands, love your, watch what he says in to show you what he's trying to get to the point in here. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water of the word. Hmm, there comes that water again from my Jewish brethren. That he might present it unto himself a glorious church and not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. He's trying to show you a unity. That's what we find in Genesis. The only time we have where man is ruling over his wife is when he is without the spirit of almighty God living in him. My God, why can't we see this? Now, brethren, so you sisters, you know, when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, when your home is filled with the Holy Spirit, God did not intend for your husband to rule over you and to be a boss over you that's not God's intent with the word. Jesus come to restore that which was lost. Now, brothers, I'm, gonna, I'm fixing to close here now. We're nearing an hour in this message here, but it's really important that you get this here. My brother, listen to me. Jesus come to a little woman at a well when you read in the Christian Bible there, and he, totally uncustomary. You know as well as I do, especially in that society there. What is this rabbi doing talking to this woman at a well? Her husband's not there. And she's just a woman. I mean, in, in the days of when Jesus was here, it's kind of like the way the Arabs do today over in these other countries and everything. A woman is just considered like uh, cattle. Unfortunately, God have mercy for that to even be said. That's what they consider a woman to be. She's more like something that you own, a possession. You know, when God created her in the Garden of Eden, she was not a possession she was one and in unity with her husband and they were one and they both had the spirit of almighty God dwelling in them and they both were given equal rule and reign over the earth. That's what God is intending to, to restore. When Jesus came on the earth, he was trying to show you that in demonstration and I'll share that with you in a moment. Let's first, so for my Jewish brethren, the sake now, I showed you how that, as we have our menorahs almost burn out here now, but the menorah, when we had the, with, with, with Hanukkah, what was it? That one cruise of oil represented the Spirit of God was indwelt inside of one vessel, one vessel that was not profaned. When Jesus spoke to the woman at the well, he said, would you bring me a drink? She said, sir, the well is deep, you don't have nothing, and we don't deal with you because you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. And for those of you that don't know about the Samaritans, Samaritans were... were were half Jew, half Gentile. When the Syrians had invaded back in 723 BCE and they scattered the northern tribes and everything, many of the women were ravished, children were brought forth by them, and, and yet they were half Jew, half Samaritan. Now that's kind of funny though, because in our law that we have now, we say that you're Jewish by your mother. Isn't that funny? Jesus said the same thing back then to her. He said he came to his own. She was part of his own. Keep that in mind, brother, sister. We, have, we change our Jewish laws and find out that you're only matching what Jesus already did himself when he was here 2,000 years ago. But he says to this woman, totally uncustomary to be speaking to her, if you knew it was as speaking to you, you'd ask me for a drink and I'd give you water. You wouldn't come draw here no more. She said, the little argument ensued on, you know, about this water. She said, our father Jacob dug this well. Claimed that to be her father. Praise God for that too. And what did he say though to her? She says, or she said, uh, he says to her, he says, you know, 
go get your husband, come here. She said, I don't have one. He said, you told the truth. You had five and the one you're living with now is not yours. She said, sir, I perceive you're a prophet. And we know that when Messiah, when Mashiach ben David ba, he will do this. He'll know what? The secrets of the heart. And he said, I am he that speaks with you. Now, the point that I wanted to make here, though, he said to her, I would give you waters that you don't have to come here to drink. I will give you waters that flow from the belly. He was giving her a sign to look for to confirm that he was the Messiah. Why? Because that she would, if she, well, how do you get the water you don't have to come to drink? When God was in the wilderness journey, when he was there, with Moses, and Moses smote the rock. He cut that rock in two with that smiting and brought forth that water of life, showing that what he did with Adam, he split Adam open and he brought out of Adam that life and he put it into his wife Eve and created another woman, give her life and would have been able to impart eternal life all the way down through all of our children. But that line was broken. And let me tell you something, if we, the way we went away from God, we got to come back to God. Redemption has got to be fulfilled based on the Word. And God was showing redemption process in the, in the Exodus journey. That's what He was doing, was showing redemption process then. And so Jesus gave her a sign. And when He was hung up there on Calvary, and we know according to Daniel that the Messiah would be cut off, before that seven week period begins, before the temple would be destroyed, Messiah would be cut off, not for himself, but for a sacrifice for sin. As I've said before, he was both scapegoat and he was a goat that set free, a scapegoat and the sacrificial goat that was offered once a year. He was a type of both. And so when his side was pierced on Calvary and his side was torn open, and the water came from his side and blood came from his side. The blood was to atone for the sin. And the water was to show that the life of Hashem lived inside of this man. Like it was with the cruise of all on Hanukkah. He was carrying the spirit of Almighty God inside of one vessel that was sanctified and cleansed and set aside for that service. It showed that the spirit of God was in him and could come out and now come back upon us. Just as God did Adam, God did this with Adam. How many years before that? Nearly 4,000 years before that, God put Adam into a deep sleep in order to break him open, in order to cut him in half, to be able to create a bride for Adam and to be able to put the Spirit of God in Adam. And so here he did. When, when sin came in and they fell, they lost that right to be able to impart eternal life to their children. Now they're born with death. But God, he loved us so much that he would not let us sit here in this situation that we're in and sin and death. But the only way to bring forth life is to, did not God say in the Torah to Moshe HaNavi? In order, that day you eat thereof, that day you will die. And there, and there must be a sacrifice for sin. Why are we, why are we killing all of these goats and lambs and, and doves and everything else for the sins that we committed? So something innocent could take our place. But the problem is we sacrifice the lamb, but the life of the lamb cannot come back upon us. If it did, we'd be a lamb instead of sons and daughters of God. If God could put his spirit into Adam and could put his spirit into this man and created this man from the dust of the ground and put his spirit inside of him and then when he was ready, he was able to open him up and create his wife and then put that spirit upon her from what he'd already created. Can he not take again in a redeemer and place create him and form him. And in order to be a kinsman redeemer, according to the law of Moses, he has to be a kinsman redeemer. So he's got to be born of a woman. That is why God said to Isaiah, a maiden shall conceive. So you, you argue with the Christian, you say virgin. They say virgin because it's pretty obvious that she was a virgin. Okay? 
We don't have to argue that fact. Why in the world then would the prophet Yeshayahu say a virgin is going to conceive when every single day that happens? Or, or a maiden is going to conceive and every day that happens. What mystery is that? There's got to be something great about this then. She's going to bring forth a son, a savior. But there's so many scriptures. David said in the Psalm 22, he cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? My brothers, it's time for us to wake up. You know, the candle lights are going out now. And darkness is coming down on the land. You Gentiles, you need to wake up yourself. You're following in the footsteps of Israel, crucifying your own Messiah. And you might say, how do you say, how, how could you say this, brother? How could you say we're crucifying the Messiah? We believe him. Many of you do, yes. But let me tell you something. Many of you out there with your traditions, with your church-isms, and I'm not against going to church, but you're taken and you crucify the word of God by your traditions. You're doing just like Jesus said to the Jews, by your traditions. My God, my God, I beg you, stick to the word of God. Men, Prayerfully repent of, from God or, or repent to God as far as when you look at your own life and everything, you've gone right back into a patriarchal society. You know, Dr. Hutt, he's at the University of Nebraska. I interviewed with him one time. Maybe I should put this on, on YouTube so you can watch the interview I did with him. It's an incredible interview. I knew these things that were hidden in the Hebrew scriptures that God never meant for a man to rule over his wife. And I knew the Greek was the same. I, 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 know, I know Lee Grady. I've had lunch with him before, me and my wife did before. Very, very wonderful man. And some people look down on him because they say he's not a scholar. Let me tell you something, he is a scholar. The man knows what he's talking about. Because I can see it in the Hebrew scriptures. And I do know what I'm talking about there. Even the rabbis know that God created us equal before the fall. But I say to you as far as husbands that are out there, She's your partner. She's not your doorman. And you need to love her the way Christ loved the church. You need to care for her. She is a weaker vessel. So God says that especially because we're still living in a carnal world to where her frailty does need to be protected. So it doesn't take it away from you being a man to be a man to protect her physically because there's a lot of evil in the world. Yes, that is true. But nowhere did he give us a right to rule over our wife. Not the way people think it is. It's just mistranslations because of the customs of the time. Dr. Hutt, does, I mentioned that again. Let me just say it real quick about Dr. Hutt. We sat down and he's, he's a Greek scholar. He's studied specifically with the Clementine writings, which are the ancient historical documentation about the life during the times of Jesus and Paul in that era. And he said that the historical writings spoke about Jesus and Paul being so different to the culture of their day. The women that followed them were liberated. They talked about how strange it was. All these single women around Paul. Not that he was doing anything wrong. I don't mean it that way there. The thing is, though, is it was not custom. Do you know that a woman could not even eat dinner at a table with a man during that time? She was to sit away from the man. She could not lounge around the way they did because of the customs. God never intended that. He doesn't intend it today. So when God says to you, or you hear the preachers out here saying, be the head of your house, put your house in order. Hmm. Maybe the best thing you could do is be praying together instead. And my Jewish brothers, my Jewish sisters that are out there, the same is for you as well. Jesus is Moshiach ben David. We have the ability to receive him even now as our own savior. There is fixing to hit our people in Israel a tremendous move where Moshiach will reveal himself. He will send Moses and Elijah, Moshe ve'alayahu hanavim, to our people. This will be a great distress he does it because Rome gets control of Israel once again. And 
It's at this time that the gospel will turn back to the Jews. We're at that door. The Palestinian state is a very key figure in this sign of this happening. But in reality, Rome will be the one that's on the seat. It's a serious situation. But I say to you, why do we wait? If we know that if there's something in your heart that tells you that Jesus is Mashiach, then why not go to your knees and cry out to him? He's able to hear you. He can hear you now. And he's willing and longing to gather us together as a hen would her own brood. He's together back in our homeland. But many of us have not gone home. And so with the ones that have not returned to the homeland, he's trying to deal with our hearts now. Won't you accept him? And I'm not going to tell you any fancy prayers to pray either. I just tell you, go to your knees and cry out to him. And call him what he really is, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. And ask him to forgive you. Open your eyes that you might see more. It's amazing the things that he'll reveal to you. God bless you. I say, Baruch Hashem. Blessed is the coming of the Lord. And it is a blessed day for that. We have that day now.